Uh, this is an interview with uh, Beverly Means to Bose the third, otherwise known as Bo, and uh, we're he's from Atlanta, and we're doing this on September 17th, uh, 2019, at his home. And I'm Mike Armstrong, and I'm going to moderate where needed. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, you won't be needed, Mike. I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> so we can start off with sort of some of your family background and growing up in Buckhead and that sort of thing. Well, I think it's easier to go way back. My family are French Huguenots and they <clears throat> came here, we don't know precisely, between 1685 and 1689. And they went to Charleston and went and settled on the Santee River. And there was a whole group of Huguenots. And my family was originally from Dieppe, France. Mom and Dad had bought the property where we're sitting here from Governor John Slate, and he bought it in 1940. And I was always told they paid $240 an acre for it, and everybody said, man, that was a deal. I said, well, not so fast. I said, at that time, you could have bought almost all of Cobb County for 15 bucks an acre. Right. And so what mom and dad did is said, okay, we're going to build our house. So they built right below me, their house, and we moved out here in the spring of 1951. And Garrow Road was a one-lane rock road from Ridgewood all the way to their house, which is a mile and a tenth. And there was only one other house on the road, and it was a little white frame house, and the man who owned it was Roddy Garrison. I was born in, obviously, November 1940 at, at Emory. And, uh, then my dad went in the Navy in 1940, spring of 1943, and then he got out in the spring of 1946. And uh, how I actually got the name Bo is kind of lost in the mystery of time, but there were three Beverly's, and my grandfather was called Beverly, his nickname was Chief, and my dad was called Bev by all of his contemporaries. And so I came along and they named me the third. So. Thank God they didn't name me brother. <laughs> so I got the nickname Bo. So when I'd go to Garden Hills, Daddy would take me to school at Garden Hills, and of course that's right next to North Fulton. That's where my daddy went to high school. Dad went to North Fulton, graduated from North Fulton, and then went to Emory, because that was right in the heart of the Depression, and he wasn't going to go off school, so Emory was a fairly good choice. And so I would walk home from Garden Hills, and the Alhambra apartments were there. Uh, the strip where Buckhead Theater used to be was there. And the barbershop was there. And I remember getting my hair cut for 50 cents on, on the way home. And that where we lived on Peachtree was called Dead Man's Curb. Because if you think about it, when you leave Buckhead, Peachtree goes pretty damn straight from the heart of Buckhead to that point and then makes about a 60 degree turn. And people would come flying down that thing, and you could hear them. I mean, you go, bam! You know, they hit the phone poles and all. But I, I remember standing up on Peach Street watching the fire trucks go to the Weinkauf fire. Really? Yeah. Was it 1947, I think? 47, 48. Yeah. yeah. And they were just one right after another. Yeah. Wow. So we, I went to Garden Hills through the fifth grade. And we moved out here, like, in the March of that. And Dad drove me to school for the next two months so I could finish. Right. And then when left Garden Hills, I ended up. My next school was Morris Brandon. Yeah. And so I went six and seven to Morris Brandon, and then Mom and Dad, West Madison got sent me to West Madison. I went there for two days, <laughs> and I came home and I said. I've been hanging out with these assholes all my life. I ain't, gonna, I ain't doing this anymore. I'm going to Northside. So I went to Northside. And Northside, at the time, uh, this was obviously before integration, we were sending about 97% of the graduating class was going off to college. And we had them going to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the whole nine yards. And, uh, and so I ended up going to Washington Lee, which is another story in itself. When you were living out here, mm -hmm. um, 
because this was pretty country, I would say, at yeah. that point. So did, you know, was was uh, were there were there, were there places in Buckhead that you know you and the gang from Northside would go to? Or, no, it, or you know, were, were there any hangouts? If if there were, I didn't know about them. Because <laughs> oh, you were good. Huh? I, no, well, I, I was I was actually very bad to be honest with you. But it had had nothing to do with uh, with the opposite sex. We when we when we lived here. The bridge was still that one lane wooden bridge. Mm -hmm. Woodland Brook was a rock road. There were only two homes on the entirety of Woodland Brook till you got to the old black community, which was right alongside the railroad tracks back down there. And that was it. Of course, Lovett wasn't here, Westminster wasn't here. And uh, there used to be a gas station down at West Paces Ferry, well, where I 75 is now. Mr. Barfield owned that. And I remember I used to go down there and buy 22 long rifle, 500 at a time, you know, 10 boxes of 50. And so we spent our youth running around these woods and we had, we had a shirt, squirrel shooting contest every year between me and Chester and Barry Graham, his brother, who could kill the most squirrels. But I mean, nobody, I mean, you know, we'd fire M1s, BARs, a friend of mine even had a smizer. When you pull the trigger on that, it sounded like tearing a piece of paper, just like that. And nobody cared. I mean, because there's nobody here. Right. There's absolutely nobody here. And in fact, one time <clears throat> I was across the river and somebody had given my dad, you know, it, it's a little cannon that's about, oh, 12. 16 inches long, about six to seven inches in diameter, with a bore on it about a little smaller than a golf ball. And we were over here, and I was loading it up with 58 caliber round balls that we had, we had uh, molded and shooting it at trees. And that thing would recoil 25 to 30 feet every time you shot it. And the only way we could set it off is we'd put a trail of powder down the barrel and set it off with the Bunsen burner. And and when that thing would go off, and all of a sudden, I look up and hear the Smyrna police. Oh, I bet. Now, Smyrna was a long way away in those days. And they had no, you know, and they came down in. I said, yes, sir, can I help you? He said, we just want to see what's going on so we can hear this damn thing all the way up in Smyrna. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry about that. You know, I said, would you like to see it? So, oh, yeah. We, <laughs> so we, we charged it up again. Boom. You know. <laughs> they, got, they got quite a kick out of that. After the Civil War, my great-grandfather's brother, William Porsche de Bose, had uh, <clears throat> graduated from Citadel, graduated from UVA, and had gone to theological school in Columbia. And uh, he was severely wounded at the Battle of Second Manassas. And when he came back, he came back as a chaplain. So <clears throat> shortly after the war was over, like three, four years, he was asked to go to Sewanee. And he more or less established the, the School of Theology at the University of South and Sewanee. And my great-grandfather, his brother, Robert Marion, his younger brother, I might add, went with him. And he was superintendent of the local school and eventually became the treasurer of the University of the South. He had a cousin, Thomas Eggleston, here in Atlanta. And I need to back up. His mother's maiden name was Elizabeth Eggleston. And he was her nephew the first Eggleston to come south, the man in the portrait behind you, George Washington Eggleston, came to Charleston in about 1800. And by his first wife, he had a Thomas Eggleston, who became known as Colonel Eggleston. And then Colonel Eggleston, uh, by his wife, Henrietta, had one son, who was Thomas Eggleston. And he and his mother moved here to Atlanta about the turn of the century, and he was a little before the turn of the century. He moved here till 1870, moved here to Atlanta, and through a progression of businesses, he became a very, very successful real estate agent. And 
my grandfather came here to Atlanta in 1908 and went to work with Thomas Eggleston and the name of the agency at the time was Purdue Eggleston and then when my daddy joined him after World War II it became DeBose Eggleston and he's the man, Thomas Eggleston is the man who left the money for Eggleston Hospital for Children and it was to honor his mother who was Henry Eggleston. My grandfather was a historian by avocation. Now you think about it, the man he's named for died in the Civil War. His father served in the Civil War, was wounded. His uncle served in the Civil War, was wounded. But he was a historian in the broadest sense. In fact, I have just sent the vast majority of his library to the Georgia Historical Society because he had books on all the surrounding states, the Native Americans, I mean, you name it. That would, he, he was quite a learned man. He was great friends with Wilbur Kurtz, who was the technical director for Gone with the Wind. And so Wilbur was the, he was a con consummate note taker. He, I mean, he had, you know, dossiers on these trips he'd taken. I mean, just everything. And, and um, so he was regarded as the preeminent historian on the Atlanta campaign, which was started in the spring of 1864 and resulted with the fall of Atlanta, and that was Sherman. And uh, so he, he and my grandfather, Franklin Garrett, who wrote the two volumes called Atlanta and Environs, which is the history of Atlanta, and as Franklin is famous for saying, if it ain't in the book, it didn't happen. <laughs> and Walter McElroy, who's the man who actually started the Atlanta Historical Society. And uh, they would all have lunch on Saturday and go off and tour the battlefields. And Dad was their driver and he did it through high school and the whole time he was at Emory and so every farmer who lived near a battlefield had plowed up cannonballs and bayonets and mini balls and buttons and whatever. And so he would walk all the cotton and cornfields while they were pontificating, picking up, you know, many balls and shell fragments and so when I was a small child he had you know two little display cases of stuff he'd picked up off the battlefields and farmers and giving him things they had found and when he was in the Navy in World War II he saw mine detectors and he said wouldn't this be great fun to go back and walk these battlefields I walked as a child and see what I could find you know, you've asked me, what did you find around here? Unfortunately, in the 1860 census, Atlanta was a town of 10,000 people. The outer defense works stood where the Fox Theater is. That's the outer defense works. <laughs> and, and so, obviously, anything in the city of Atlanta, per se, was gone. I mean, the trenches at Grant Park were there, but nothing ever happened there. The Battle of Atlanta was fought out I-20 where Murphy High School was, and it, for the most part, well, there was a trench on Leggett's Hill, and Dad and I did find an entire case of 58 caliber mini balls buried there, which was a thousand of them. And yeah, I've got that. Peachtree Creek looked almost exactly as it, it, it does today. That little road going alongside the creek was there. The site of Collier Mill, you know, they bought the stuff up and put it there. And Dad had some plaques commissioned for that little park down on the creek. Unfortunately, they were bronze and they were stolen within a month. Never put back. So you did, it, well, I guess what you're saying is in this general part of the city, you poked around where you could, yeah. but there wasn't much. There wasn't much. Now, this trench line right outside my house is the one that goes over and where the headmaster's house at Lovett is was a four gun battery. You know, and we found shell fragments and there used to be a Confederate fort down where uh, Chatty Hoochie Brick was down at Bolton. And I remember Dad and I, I mean we found a lot of Union shells in there that exploded. When you all were amassing the collection mm -hmm. and it was in your parents' house in the lower right. level, <clears throat> and you were you brought people there to tour it. Right. Was that the gestation for 
thinking about later on donating it to the history center or well just it's kind of two separate things? it's well it's really when we moved out here on the river in spring of 51 we dad built the glass front cases to put the dug relics we had already found because I mean we'd been doing this for six years by that time and we had a lot of stuff right. to be real honest with you. And when I was in the eighth grade, spring of 53, uh, Dad asked me, he said, would you really be interested in collecting this in its original form? I said, sure, sounds like a great idea. So I came home from school that day and there's an air compressor sitting in the front yard with a note on it telling me where to start digging under the house. So over the next 20 years we built and filled six rooms up. And, uh, and mom would allow, you know, classes from Lovett and West Mountain Boy Scouts to come. You know, Daddy was at work, so she'd conduct the tours during right. the day. And uh, but what really happened, Mike, was that originally Dad was going to leave the collection to me, and I had in my will that something happened to me and go to W and L because I didn't know what else. We didn't know what else to do with it. I mean, the Atlanta Historic Society was here, but it was primarily focused on the records. I mean. Like it was, a, it was a library archives is what it was. It was not into the world of three-dimensional objects. And it was an interesting story. Mr. Walter McElreath, who was my granddad's great friend, but he made his money at Life in Georgia. He was also a WNL graduate, by the way. He started the historic site in 27. So Mr. Mack changed his will, and in his will, he left his entire state to the Atlanta Historical Society. And that was about the time Ms. Inman decided to sell what's been now known as the Swan House. And I had always heard these stories, you know, because to be honest with you, this was coming down in 1966 right as I got out of the Navy. As an expediency, Kathy and I were living at my folks' house. Well, I was just trying to figure out what to do, you know. And uh, I could—I was listening to my stories. My dad was telling me over dinner during this period of time. Dad says to me, "I want the collection to stay here in Atlanta." Uh, I went and I made this presentation. I had a little slideshow show what the collection was, and I said. I want you to remember one thing. If you accept this collection, it is going to forever change who you are and what you do. I don't think anybody really grasped that. And the first museum building we built, it was uh, the building was finished in 93, about 85,000 square feet. And uh, that the cause of that was the gift of dance in my collection. Eileen and I got married in 79. And uh, y'all don't need that story for this thing, but, but Fleming Keith came to me and said, will you hold the WL alumni party for us? So we said, sure. And at first it was just sliced roast beef from Kroger Webb and the Claire's from the Reeves and you know, the first one had about 120 people show up, and about that time, Eileen was starting to learn to cook. And so every year she would do more and more and more of it. And, you know, the last year we did it, which was 19, 2000. Probably, yeah. it, remember, we, we had a break, and then we did it again in 2000. Right. We had 450 people show up here. Once she started doing this party for WNL, people started coming to her and saying, "Will you do something like this for me?" And so I think said, "There's an opportunity here." So she f created elegant events. We would do these off-site parties for Kodak and Border Delta Airlines and 
uh, Anderson Windows and Boeing and you know you you name them. So I had the bright idea. I I I, I would have Eileen tell these groups that are coming, I said, if you'll make a donation to the Atlanta History Center, I'll take you down to my parents' home and you can see our Civil War collection in situ. I learned how abysmally ignorant most people are about American history, especially Civil War. When we did the exhibit, Gordon and I decided that, you know, we would try to do it from a more holistic standpoint. In that first little area you walk into saying what happened between 1788 or 89 and 1860 is the most important part to me of the whole deal. So when we redo this thing, we're gonna show a hell of a lot more of that. Uh, and we're gonna try to use more technology to show what each side was trying to do and what the results were. And then we're going to try to deal a lot more with reconstruction, you know, and the devastation that the South suffered. People don't focus on that.